Hello class. Okay, this lesson incorporates the production possibilities curve, which we did early in the semester. Uh, it was in chapter two in the semester in which I did this video. And the trade line, which I will put down below. So you might remember from the production possibilities curve, what you have is a line that, or a curve that plots out all the possible combinations of good A and good B that can be produced given your constraints and your constraints are your factors of production which are land, labor, capital, entrepreneurial ability and then those things, those factors of production are mixed together with technology to get this production possibilities curve. So imagine that uh, you're living in a country and there's no possibility of trade then you are constrained by your production possibilities curve. So if the people in this country for example liked uh, let's say two B's with every A that is they like twice as much B as A they would naturally locate someplace like this and then uh, if this was done on graph paper this number over here let's just imagine that that number is a hundred just making this up now if that number is a hundred and they like twice as much B as A then this number down here would be 50. On the other hand if the preferences in the country were such that they liked roughly equal amounts of A and B, they would locate someplace like this, which is kind of in the middle, where there would be equal amounts of A and B consumed. Or if they liked more A than B, they would be down here someplace. And these points down here represents, represent consuming more A than B. So again, that's the, just the production possibilities curve. Every point on the line represents a combination of A and B that we can achieve. Any point out here, these points out here, represent combinations of A and B that we can achieve because we're constrained by our uh, factors of production or our technology. So that's all review from chapter two. Now down here I want to plot out for you the trade line. So the, the trade line is a graphical representation of what you can trade. So you need uh, some starting point like the terms of trade. So let's imagine that the terms of trade are something simple. So let's imagine that uh, three B's trade for one A. Three B's trade for one A. So that would mean if you had three B's, that would be here, and you traded them all away for A, the most you could hope for is one A. So you would get a trade line that looks like this. You could be here or here. On the other hand, if you had six B's in the terms of trade where three B's trade for one A, and you happen to have six, you could trade three away and get one, right? Or you could trade all six away and get two. So then you'd have a trade. My, my line's not too good. <laughs> that dot should be there. So can you see that depending on what you started with, which we call the initial endowment, depending on what you started with, you get a trade line where its slope describes the terms of trade in this case, the slope is minus 2 over 1 because the terms of trade are the 2B trade for, or excuse me, 3 over 1, sorry. The slope of the line is 3 over 1 because the terms of trade were 3B's trade for 1A. So uh, one more just to make sure you understand the trade line. Imagine you started with 6B's and 6A's. So that would be out here somewhere. 6B's and 6A's and you wanted to know all of your trading possibilities it would look just like these lines over here that is it would have the same slope and that would be your trade line so you could move anywhere along there if you did this on graph paper you could actually read off the combinations of A and B that are possible with trade based on those terms of trade so if you had some other terms of trade of course the trade line would have a different slope but again, its location depends on what you started with. Okay, so I hope that's enough for you to understand uh, this question that I found on an old exam. It says, use the production possibilities curve and trade line to illustrate the following. The terms of trade are two A's trade for one B, and the preferences are people like to consume two A's with every B. So the first thing we do is we just kind of sketch out a typical production possibilities curve. All right. 
and then it says find the before trade consumption point and label it point A. Okay, so if we don't engage in any trade, we're constrained by our production possibilities curve, and our preferences are that we like two A's with every B, so that would put us over here someplace. It would be somewhere like here, which I'll call point A. And even though it didn't ask in this problem, if that number worked out to be, say, 100, just making that up now, if that number worked out to be 100, this number over here would have to be 50 because we know that people like two A's with every B. Okay, so that's this piece right here. And then it says find the before trade production point in B. Well, if you don't trade, what you produce is what you eat, or what you produce is what you consume. So without trade, point A is also the before trade production point. So these two questions are kind of tricky. They're the same place. If you don't trade, the consumption point and the production point have to be the same. It's obvious. If you lived on a small island and you didn't trade and you caught fish, what's for dinner? Only fish. You couldn't trade them for chicken. Okay, so then it says find the after trade consumption point, label it C, and the after trade production point, and label it D. So to find the after trade consumption and production, we need some information about the terms of trade and the trade line. So I'm just going to come over here and I'm just going to sketch out what the trade line looks like. So the terms of trade are two A's trade for one B. So that would mean if you had two A's, it would trade for only one B. So the trade line is kind of flat. Can you see that? It's kind of flat and it'll have a slope of minus one half. So you take that trade line, it's kind of silly the way I'm going to do it, but you imagine taking that trade line with a ruler and you kind of walk that trade line over here into the production possibilities curve and it could be anywhere, right? You could put it anywhere, but of course the best place to put it is where the trade line is just tangent to the production possibilities curve. In other words, that is the very best place you can be. It'll be obvious in a minute. So this dot right here is on the production possibilities curve and so it is the after trade production point. After trade production point we call D. So basically what happens when we engage in trade is the uh, small country that used to be operating here is going to move over here. That is, they're going to produce less B. See that? Excuse me, that's A. They're going to produce less A and they're going to produce way more B. See that? It sounds kind of weird, like why would they do that? They don't even like B that much, they really like A and now with trade they're going to produce less A, see that? And a lot more B. And the reason they do that is because that B trades really well in the rest of the world so they will trade along this trade line, move along this trade line, and they'll move over here someplace. And the way you can find this, this is point C, the way you can find that point is you know that their preferences are two for one and that's described by this point right here. So point C is actually right there because that line, this line right here represents two for one, right? Two uh, from the preferences, two A's for every B. So they would uh, move here and they would consume this much A and then they would consume this much B. So obviously there will be winners and losers from trade. Why are economists overwhelmingly in favor of free trade? The reason is because where were we before trade and where are we after trade? Before trade we're stuck here at this point on the production possibilities curve but after trade we're actually beyond the production possibilities curve. We're way out here and people consume more of A and more of B. If you think about it, before trade we only made this consume this much A and now we consume this much out here. Before trade we only consume this much B and now we consume this much here. So you might ask, well gee, if it's so great, why do people sometimes say international trade is bad? And the reason is because there are some winners and some losers. The losers in this case let's see, would be the workers in industry A 
because before trade this is how much production of A there was but after trade there's only this much production of A so the workers and the stockholders the uh, CEO the people who lived in the town where industry A is located they're all worse off can you see that because output's gone down on the other hand the workers and the stockholders the CEO and so forth in industry B they're all better off you should stop this video and see if you can figure that out okay so here's how it is this is how much B we were producing before trade and after trade we're producing way up here this amount so there's a lot more output in industry B stockholders are happy in industry B so there's some losers over here some winners over here but also very important keep in mind that in terms of consumption that is people who aren't particularly related to industry A or B they are all better off because they were located here and now consumption's way out there alright so I hope you found that uh, helpful there's several questions like this out on old test and um, if you don't quite understand uh, post me something on the discussion board and I'll try to help you alright good luck